13, 2021 uh, Board of Education meeting to order. I have a roll call, please, Mrs. Larson. Yes. Mr. Sprague? Here. Mrs. Wachowski? Here. Mr. Alexandrovich? Here. Mrs. Sapersky? Here. Dr. Bear? Here. Dr. Khan is excused. We are all present. Thank you. Uh, can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm, uh, item three on the agenda, I'm looking for uh, a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion has been uh, made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Community comment. Participants under this agenda item must be residents of the Franklin Public School District or parents guardians of Franklin Public School District students and must limit their statements to three minutes. Uh, with a maximum of 15 minutes for any and all comment. If the community comment is related to an agenda item, the board may respond to the comment either at the end of the community comment session or during the discussion of that agenda item. The board may not discuss a comment or question that does not relate to an agenda item. Uh, Michelle Winky. I brought handouts today. I just wanted to have a little bit of stuff. You guys are fun talking about this. So these are charts. So as you see, I go around each thing. Okay. So a little um Background information, my younger two kids just finished up second and fourth grade at Southwood Glen Elementary. Um, I'm gonna speak just of them because my older son's a little bit different case. But I've handed out work that mostly came from the fourth grade at the end of the year of my daughter. And I'm now homeschooling my kids to find out my children do not know how to spell what, do not know how to spell simple basic things. They don't know punctuation, capitalization, spelling, how to make a complete sentence. They have capital letters in the middle of sentences, in the middle of words. My daughter does not know her multiplications going into fifth grade. She cannot even tell me what four times three is, and we have been working on this for a month and a half. I am just so upset that this is the stuff that my daughter has brought home from a school that is supposed to be a very accelerant school. We are a district that is above the average, and this is what is producing. And I look back at my kids' grades, for literacy and math, and Molly has gotten last year in literacy threes, meaning she's at grade level, in math 3.5, four, and four, meaning she was at grade level and above. Elliot um, had gotten two threes in literature in second semester or quarter trimester, whatever. He got a 2.5 both in math and literacy because he was rushing, we had to talk about that. But he had had a four, went down to a 2.5, went back up to a 3.5. So my kids have been getting the threes and fours what was grade level? I'm letting you ask you, can you read what my children have been writing? Those are tests, and the teachers are saying that that's okay. There is no personal responsibility for my kids to do any better than a very, very, I don't even know, bare minimum, just because they got the concepts down. My daughter is trying to do 600 plus, like, well, 628 plus, like, 42 or something, and she cannot even remember to carry these numbers over and struggles with it. Or if it's the multiplication, she's like, what is six times seven? And she can't get this. And this is fifth grade. I've talked to some of my parent friends who are, have grade level kids. They say, yeah, spelling's atrocious. Multiplication is not existing. We need to fix this because the basics have gone out the window at our elementary kids. They don't know the basics. So I really want you to look at those and think we need to work on penmanship. We need to work on spelling and grammar because what they are presenting to the world is reflection on themselves, and it's going to be a reflection of Franklin, of what they've produced. And I've seen high school spellers, they don't know how to spell very. It was B-A-R-Y. This was a 10th grader who wrote a note, B-A-R-Y. So it's throughout the district, it's throughout our kids, and I know there are some kids who are great spellers, great penmanship things, but my kids were not held responsible to do anything better. With that being said, I just want you to look at those and try to see if we can implement more basics into the classroom. And then second of all, 
I know the free group has been here and I just want to let you know that they told me that even though their group is not based around critical race theory itself, they believe aspects of it. So I don't know what, where they've been, but they're basically saying they want critical race theory, which is here because we have SEL, which is the curriculum for critical race theory. But anyways, I digress. One last thing I'm asking, um, I'm asking if anyone will make a statement regarding Attorney General Merrick Garland and the NSBA's September 29th letter to the president. This letter classified parents as domestic terrorists under the Patriot Act. I'd like to know if you agree. Do you see me or any of the other parents speaking here as domestic threats? Um, I'd like you to make a statement at the end of this meeting during the school board comments. And I'm sorry, I have to leave shortly and will not be here to listen to if anybody says anything, um, but I will be paying attention for that video to be posted. And so I'm just asking somebody either say, yes, you agree that we are domestic terrorists or not. Um, and just remember that silence is very loud too. So I do appreciate your time. And if anybody wants that letter that the NSBA sent, I will send it right back to everybody. Thank you, Angela Burkhart. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It sounds like it's coming through the microphone, but I, I don't know the answer. Thank you for your time. Never did I ever think I would be going before a school board but in order to move forward, I must be here and speak for three minutes and make this official. On Monday, October 4th, my 12-year-old seventh grader brought a book club home from school that was assigned to her to begin reading, so she began reading where she left off at school. She brought the book to me because it made her uncomfortable and felt inappropriate. Here is the paragraph she brought to me. Okay, thank you. Joey takes his jacket off and puts it around his shoulders. He presses me back gently as he's on top of me and his lips are brushing mine. His body feels warm in a way that I need. He cups my face with his tattooed hands and when I close my eyes, he kisses me. The Supers TV is a hum in the background as Joey explores my mouth. Over the dryer, I can hear the angry rise and fall of Mr. Halper's voice, surely to start another argument. But Joey doesn't seem to pay attention to the sound of the chairs being dragged, maybe tossed over. Joey runs his lips along my bare neck and nuzzles me like one of his kittens as I take in the smell of his dirty hair. He moves his hands over my bottom until I'm twitchy with need. I don't know how long we lie there kissing, but when he finally starts to slide his chilly hands inside the back of my pants, I push him, sit up, afraid. My mouth still tingling, I'm dizzy. I was in shock. I left a message with the principal and I was informed by the principal along with the assistant superintendent of continuous improvement that the book would remain in circulation due to policy. I read the book myself and found 11 spots in the book that are beyond the maturity level of a 12 year old. I asked for a courtesy email informing parents of the contents of the book. Nowhere in the policy does it state that that cannot be done. This book deals with sexual content and assault far, far more mature than a 12 year old. All topics in which parents should be warned to help ch their child process this information. Withholding this information from parents is neglectful. Although I understand to have a book reviewed by a board, a committee must be formed along with following policy. I'm formally putting in a request for reconsideration of this book. I'm asking one more time in the time being to extend the courtesy to parents about what their children are currently reading and have read, read this school year when it comes to this book. It's only the right thing to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Adam Wittenberg. Hello. Um, as previously stated, I'm an IT contractor. Um, and I, I believe in the Franklin School District. Um, when we decided to go here, we really looked to see which school we wanted to send our kids to go, wanted to send our kids to. Um, and when looking at it, it was a forerunner school. And that's my expectation of the Franklin School District is to be a forerunner. Um, and as everybody's here fighting tonight and continues to fight, you know, I'm gonna bring up the masks again. 
you know, and I'm trying to understand um, what it is, if it's fear, ignorance, power, control. I mean, I pray that you're never in the position to have some of your rights taken away and forced to do something you don't want to do, like you're having done with our kids. We don't want our kids in masks, and those that you know want to wear masks, that's fine. I don't want to have any forced mandates on anybody, especially for something that doesn't have any scientific backing. Prior to COVID, science did exist, and there was science behind masks. Um, and I understand fear. Um, beginning of COVID, um, when all this came out, everybody was dying around you know around the world, and I thought, this is it. We're dead. You know, I'm not that lucky. Um, and as the world was shutting down, I was getting busier. I worked in five different states, uh, 230 unique visits with uh, over 300 truck rolls. And I know what it was like to come home every day with an immunocompromised person in my household and to strip before I went in the house to take a shower um, and praying to God that I didn't infect anybody. And what I saw going out there is the narrative that's being pushed on the media didn't match facts. Um, what I was seeing when I was working with other medical directors, other business owners, things weren't adding up. Um, and then I kept on doing more and more research. And the narrative that the media is pushing does not match science and facts. So my request is to bring up the, to retract the mask mandates for our kids and to stop segregating the students based off of somebody's opinions and ideas. Um, I ask you all to go home and lay down your fear and your ego and try to look at everything unbiasedly, um, to take a step back, turn off the media, and see what's going on around the world in Norway, Singapore, um, the UK, Russia, China, India, uh, Mexico, and see what they're doing and what their policies are and where their numbers are truly at. Not what the media says, but what their ministries of health say, says. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item five, consent agenda. Um, looking for a um, motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All right, the motion's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, school board announcements. Announcements by school board members. <clears throat> Does anybody have any announcements? Thank you. Uh, school board calendar, regular Board of Education meeting, Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. Uh, Board of Education Workshop, Wednesday, November 10th, 2021 at 6, and a regular board meeting on November 10th, 2021 at 7. Those are all at the ECC. Item 8, District Administrator Update. Dr. Miller, please. Okay, just move that closer so you can hear me. Good evening, everyone. So um, we've had a really successful homecoming week last week, and um, we're really proud of our students, and in particular our football team. They've been really, really successful. Um, we are ranked the number one seed for our uh, conference here, and therefore we're going to be hosting a lot of games in Franklin. So if you haven't gotten to a game yet, you'll still have an opportunity to do that. It's difficult to believe that we're at the point of the year where we're already holding parent-teacher conferences. Um, our conferences last year were virtual, um, but this year we're providing our parents a choice of a virtual conference or an in-person conference, so they'll get to choose that. And we're looking forward to having a, a lot of contact with our parents to further engage them in the learning that's going on. I'm pleased to share that Franklin's drug-free community grant will continue to be funded for five years bringing $625,000 of direct funding for youth substance misuse prevention. This is a grant that the health department in the city of Franklin um, manages. It's led by representatives of the various sectors of our community, and it's called Volition, if you haven't heard of them. Volition works to prevent alcohol, tobacco, and drug use by educating young people to make informed decisions. 
Our school district has helped initiate this grant. It was back in 2016. I was involved in that. And currently our staff is really active and a number of our students are active in, in volition. So I think that's a really great thing for the school district and for the city. Finally, um, I'd like to announce that this evening in the consent agenda, our board accepted a generous gift of $6,000 from Rexnord for our Sabre Robotics Club. So they're gonna use that money for supplies and materials for their robot that they built and then possibly for some of the travel. So we're extremely grateful for that donation <laughs> and we'll be recognizing them as Friends of Franklin in the near future. So that concludes my report. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Item nine, Wisconsin School Board Recognition Week. Dr. Miller again. Okay, that's please. me again. <laughs> So last week was uh, National School Board Recognition Week and I'm proud to recognize our school, school board members who play a vital role in keeping students' best interests in mind. Serving on a board that represents children and their future, in my opinion, is more important than any other board that these individuals could choose to serve on. It not only takes time, it takes heart and it takes courage. So I sincerely thank you for that. Your service does make a difference on behalf of the students and the staff and the community. I'd like to thank you. And you have a little bag that has a small gift. Um, actually, it's a picture of a gift because it wasn't quite <laughs> delivered yet. But um, again, I thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Item uh, B, uh, seclusion and restraint, uh, restraint report. Mrs. Cody, please. Good evening. It's always interesting um, transitioning to these reports. Um, so after a, a fun celebration. So yes, I am here this evening to share the seclusion and restraint report um, for the district. The purpose of the, the report is really in accordance with Wisconsin Act 118. We are required to report annually um, the use of seclusion and restraint in, in our public schools. So we report annually and then we report once again to DPI by December 1st. The use of seclusion and restraint is very rarely used and it's really um, during those times when a student's behavior presents a clear, present and imminent risk to the physical safety of the student or others and is the least restrictive intervention feasible. So again, um, today, tonight we will talk about the data from last year as well as a three-year um, review. And also I'll just touch briefly on the measures that we take both proactively and responsibly to reduce the number of seclusion and restraints. So the first slide here is really the raw data. So the number of instances of seclusion and restraint. Um, and it is also uh, recording the number of students with disabilities that are secluded or restrained. I'm really going to switch to the next slide though because this slide to me um, is a little more indicative of our efforts as a district to really reduce um, and, and at some point really eliminate the use of seclusion and restraints. So as you look at this uh, graph on the slide, again, remember this is not the number of students involved, but the number of incidents. And you can see that at three of our schools, there was a, a significant reduction in the number of restraints and seclusions. And when you add up the numbers across the district, um, from 1920 to 2021, uh, when it came to restraints, we were roughly 40% 40, 40 uh, reduction, and then with seclusion, 61% of a reduction. Mm -hmm. So we've taken some time to review that data and consider what efforts um, are really making an impact to reduce mm -hmm. um, the number of instances. So we have done some overall um, improvements as a system. So when you think about our um, social and emotional learning efforts, we have been very consistent. Last year was the first year that really 4K through 12, we had some consistent practices in place like community circles every day, restorative 
practices. Um, and just again, you know, uh, emphasizing relationship building with students and um, getting to know our students, their strengths and their needs, and really connecting with them. We've also focused on trauma sensitive um, schools over the last several years. And then we've also um, have some very targeted efforts that I'll talk about on the next slides. So a couple of um, key measures that we've that we will continue to take and some that are new. Um, again, I've mentioned several times already, we're proud of the fact that we have been awarded the school-based mental health services grant and that um, work has really just begun. We had our student services staff come together in September on our first professional development day. And that is really where we um, started to dig into um, what that grant can provide for us. And I'll share a little bit more about that when we get to the at-risk report. And then we continue to invest in training. Um, it's nonviolent non crisis intervention and prevention training. So Heike Logic has been a trainer for us for several years and she's like a master trainer now um, over the course of time. And this summer we invested in another on-site trainer, which gives us the opportunity to um, increase the number of staff members who can be trained. It increases our opportunities to um, engage in training and debrief on a more frequent basis. And um, they're also able to provide more training in when it comes to small groups um, to develop a plan around specific students as well as just thinking about um, de-escalation, conflict pre prevention and positive behavior supports just in general. Um, so they were, we're expecting that that additional layer of training will have again, a positive impact um, on our students. And then I talked earlier about that targeted um, effort. And so this is our third year of the Enhancing Social and Emotional Skills in Students with IEPs, the ES3 grant. So this is our final year. And um, the schools where we had those reductions, the significant numbers of a reduction, those schools were the schools that engaged in the learning um, as part of the ES3 grant. So the grant focuses on four components. So it's about supporting those individual students. It's about engaging the family and community in different ways. There is a significant level of coaching that happens. So um, this is also Hycologic as well. Um, so she coaches not only individual teachers, but she coaches teams because um, the idea, if you look at the graphic on the right hand side is that when we focus on like individual student needs, we will learn about evidence-based improvement strategies and then we'll continue to layer on professional development and coaching. And so through that learning around one student will improve as a system. So when that student moves on um, and makes gains, and if we see another student who may be struggling, we're able to apply that learning and that team process um, in a different way to impact student learning. And oftentimes the evidence-based improvement strategies that we learn when we're working on these smaller teams can apply again at a universal level. So the idea is we start small to learn and then we scale this whole thing up across the district. So like I said, last year she worked um, with teens at three schools and this year um, she is working with teens at the remaining schools. So all seven schools will have engaged in learning um, as part of the ES3 grant. And, um, I just had a meeting this day with the, today with the state um, mentor and it's, it's just really impactful work. So I hope that next year when I come back um, in September to share, we'll have an even greater reduction. So that is the report. Any questions at this point? Go ahead. Please, Mrs. McConkey. So the coaching is kind of a new piece to the program. And who are you coaching, the kids or the teachers? The coaching has been in place. Um, this is the third year with this grant. So, um, but we've expanded the level of coaching and she coaches staff members. So she'll work with um, educational assistants, um, cross categorical teachers, classroom teachers, anyone who's a member of that child's team. Um, and parents are also um, very well involved. So it's a team coaching that's a little more unique um, than other coaching models we've had in the district. 
And then your report also talks about increasing the training from quarterly to monthly. So does that mean um, they're getting the same people are getting training more frequently or you're just trying to get more people? We're trying to um, be more timely with that training and just to be able to coordinate and offer more opportunities. So with the ES3, they do meet monthly, but with the CPI training, that would be um, different teams um, throughout the school district to train more often, but also to be able to provide debriefing opportunities for teams too. Um, and to be more responsive when we see issues come up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Um, first, I wanted to say I appreciate you providing the historical data so that we can look at the trends over time. Um, I appreciate seeing that in your report. You sort of addressed this by mentioning that certain schools with significant reduction um, were the schools that were touched by the grant. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any way you can comment on whether there's a role for overall student population size since we're given raw numbers oh. in terms of number of incidents versus sort of a percentage of student yeah. body population. Yeah. And then conversely, whether certain schools might just have a higher population of students who might be more at risk of sure. um, being subject to seclusion or restraint. Yeah, great question. So it doesn't, um, the, it's a very small number. I mean, it's, you know, a fewer than, I mean, if you, uh, I'm trying to see, 3, 12, it's 6, 1, 2, 3, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 students total across the district. Um, and it really, there isn't really necessarily one school or one, you know, it, it, it just, you know, we service all of our students, no matter what their area of disability or, um, you know, wherever, whatever their background is, you know, we service all students across all of our schools. So it wouldn't necessarily be, we wouldn't really expect to see this more at one school versus another site. Right. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you state it that way, that actually does really put your point into perspective. 12 students over yeah. the whole school district. Not that we want any students right. to have to experience this. But. Right, yeah, yeah, thank you. Just would there ever be a reason why you, the kid wouldn't have a disability? Because they match, the yep. numbers match right down the line. Yes, this does include students with and without um, disabilities or with, with, and with, with or without IEPs, yes. Are there likely to be students without IEPs that, that this happens to? On occasion, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, depending on circumstances. I'm just glad to see the numbers down. Yes. Um, I know it's the same amount of, same, it's roughly the same amount of kids, mm -hmm. but there are less, less incidents, which mm -hmm. I think, I, I think mm -hmm. says that the training is working, mm -hmm. or at least it's on the road to working, yes. and we'll see again next year. But, yes. um, Absolutely. but I'm glad to see the incidents go down mm -hmm. and drastically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've got, um, with the addition of, um, I had a um, student services system specialist that had resigned last year and went to work uh, for DPI. And so then I now replaced that person coming into this year and he has a background and some expertise in this area. So he's been teaming with um, Hycologic and it's just, again, I'm, you know, I mean, we're only a month and a half in, but it was like a week into the school year, they were already really focused on working with the teams. So I want to sustain the progress. All right, anyone else have any questions? Thank you, Mrs. Cody. You're welcome. Uh, item C, at risk report. Ms. Athman and Ms. Jewell, please. So I will, um, I have the opportunity just to introduce uh, both of our guests here tonight. So Anna Athman is our new um, social worker, school social worker at Franklin High School. And um, she, when Dr. Miller spoke earlier about volition, she is involved in volition as well as many other efforts um, to meet the needs of our students at the high school. So we're glad that she joined us here in Franklin this year. And then Ms. Steph Jewell is one of our associate principals at Franklin as well. So they have partnered on the work around our at-risk reporting as well as the development of the plans. 
I'm going to turn it over to them. All right. Thank you for having us here today. So we'll go over the children's at risk. You can just move that a little bit yes. closer so that people in the audience can hear you. Yeah, just put it real close. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> so we will be going over the children's at risk report. Um, so I just wanted to first to give a definition of at risk for the Wisconsin legislature. Um, so it defines children at risk as students in grades 5 to 12 as one, if they are a dropout, they would be considered at risk from graduating high school. And then they might, must meet two or more of the following. So if they are one or more years behind their age group in the number of credits, so we looked at this data and took that if they were in ninth grade, they would need to have below 0.5 credits. If they were in 10th grade, they would need to have below 4.5 or below. 11th grade would be 12.5 or below. And 12th grade would be 20 credits or below. And then um, another aspect of it would be they are two or more years behind their age group in basic skill levels. So we looked at that data and we took the SPIRE test for the 9th and 10th grade. And then we also took the ACT test scores as well and considered that into it if they were below their peers in those basic skill levels. Also, the next one would be habitual truants. So that would be defined as five unexcused absences um, for partial or the whole day. So that would be considered um, criteria as well. And then next one would be parents. So we looked at if there's parents in the district, they would be considered at risk, which that one's self-explanatory. <laughs> Um, and then we also looked at adjudicated delinquents, so those students that are involved with the um, juvenile courts, the House of Corrections. And then um, we also looked at the data for eighth grade students who meet any of the following criteria. So their scores in their exams um, would be considered below basic level um, or need support. So we looked at that data as well to consider. So. Um, all in all, they would have to meet two of the following criteria if they're considered at risk for graduating high school. So then this next slide just has the overview of the data. So you can see uh, primarily the data actually comes from the prior school year. So we're looking at 2020, 2021 data here. Um, so when we look at that data and break it down, um, of either students who were dropouts or had two or more of the criteria were, that were listed on the previous slide. We had nine sophomores who are considered at risk statutorily, 21 juniors, 21 seniors, and seven seniors plus. So students who are beyond that 12th year um, of school. And then B is a new this year. So we do have any of the students at the House of Correction included in this report. And you'll notice that that data is not based on last year. And there's a very important reason for that. And it's that the population of students at the House of Correction fluctuates quite dramatically, even in just the summer months. So the students that were at the House of Correction in the spring are likely not at the House of Correction any longer. In fact, the data that we pulled from this year, the third Friday count is not even an identical match to the current students who are enrolled at the House of Correction. So we went off of the newer data to try to establish that, trying to make sure that we're focusing on the students that we would potentially be impacting and developing plans for and working with. Um, and then below you can see we had 58 students identified as statutorily at risk at Franklin High School, um, and then 11 students identified as statutorily at risk within the Milwaukee House of Correction. Uh, we had four students that did not graduate in the 2020-21 school year um, who did not then re-enroll. We had seven total. Three of those students are re-enrolled and trying to complete um, their high school diploma at Franklin this year. Um, and then we had 11 of 58 students who are on the report this year that continued to be at risk from the report last year. Can you say that one more time? Uh, we had 11 students who are on this year's report who were also on last year's report. Okay. So they carried over. Uh, so this table kind of shows you overall trends. Um, and you'll notice the, la the bottom line should actually have 58 plus 11. Um, so in total, if you're including Franklin High School and the House of Correction, we have 69 students who are considered at risk of not graduating. 
um, you'll notice that between last year and this year, the numbers have increased. Um, we do believe that COVID has had an impact on this for various reasons. Um, so one, just in terms of consistency of instruction and support. So for example, at Franklin High School, um, last year we eliminated gold block, which is one of our um, primary means of meeting students in terms of support. It's time for reteaching, reassessment, extra, extra support that we eliminated to try to mitigate COVID and the spread um, in our building that is now back in place this year. Um, in addition, we had a quite significant increase in the number of students who were considered habitually truant last year. Kind of hard to determine the exact why for that, why they had so many unexcused absences, um, more so than prior years, but that was also definitely an increase as well. Um, and then we had those um, additional students from the House of Correction that we added in this year as well. All right, so we just wanted to go over some programs and services that um, the Franklin Public Schools offer. So we have many different services and programs, and then each student will also have an at-risk plan, at -risk plan to help them um, be able to graduate high school. So some of these programs that we have are student services. So schools have counselors, social workers, special education, faculty, um, psychologists to help students in their um, adventures throughout their schooling. We also have supplemental instruction, so like tutoring before and after school help to get help with um, different classes to help those grades get up as well. Um, we have alternative programs, so we do have an alternative program at Franklin High School called Envision, and then we also have outside programs as well, such as like Connects Learning Center that students attend, um, GPS, um, as well. And then we also have vocational programs, so the transition programs um, to help students transition throughout their schooling to high school. Um, and then we help prepare them for the skills that they're going to need for their future as well, in college or their career. Um, we also have health and critical issues programs, so child abuse programs, health services, health instruction, um, and crisis intervention as well that we help with those at-risk students. And then here are some um, different supportive strategies that have been implemented. So for example, the student services support, it lists different um, examples of what we do, counseling, crisis intervention, family meetings, check-ins, check out, things like that to help them be connected to school. Um, we also have personalized plans. Um, so it might include goal setting, modified schedules, project-based um, learning, also attendance check-ins as well, kind of finding those barriers of why students aren't wanting to come to school and how we can help them. Um, additional instruction time with teachers, so like Mrs. Jewell mentioned, during Gold Black, we have that back this year to help students in those academic classes get ahead and not behind. And then we also have students, special education students who might have an IEP, so individualized education plan, um, and we help them with extra support. They also have study skills classes as well to help them in their academics with the special education teacher. And then we also have the alternative education option. So right now we have 11 students at Connects Learning Center. Um, we have 11 students in Division, which is housed right in Franklin High School. We have two students in Project Success, and then we have one student at GPS right now. I just want to clarify, those are students who are in those programs who are on the at-risk list. We do have other students who are not considered statutorily at risk, but we have identified as being at risk, maybe just based on credits or having other social emotional needs where Franklin High School isn't the best placement. So we do have additional students there, but these are just the ones that are at risk. And those are unique, like the 11 students at Connects are not, none of them are simultaneously enrolled in one of the other options. It's sort of like they're in one or the other. Correct. Correct. Yes. There are some students who are enrolled at either Connects Learning Center or Envision um, or even Project Success who also attend Franklin High School for a portion of their day, but they don't combine alternatives. Got it. Thank you. The IEP students are unique too, right? Correct. Want me to back up? 
I think we're good. Any questions? Oh, I didn't hear the question. Oh, you're finished. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to navigate my technology here. Yep. So in addition to everything else that was shared in terms of the support strategies, um, I also wanted to share the goals for the mental health grant. So um, you can see here they're very specific. I'll let you read them. Um, but we're really focusing on um, anxiety uh, and um, again, prolonged sadness, uh, very concerning when we see the number of students who uh, are, have seriously considered suicide in the last 12 months. Um, so we, we, for the grant, um, we gathered data through surveys um, of the students. And so we kind of looked again at trends over time and then we tried to identify um, a reasonable number as far as uh, um, setting a goal. So each one of these would be like a reduction but of, like so we wanna re um, reduce the number of students reporting anxiety to under 45, it's currently 40, uh, 47%. So we have, you know, there's smaller increments, but um, it was just kind of a, a place to start. So the goal is again, to really consider um, ways that we can continue to beef up our student support so that it's, um, we continue to provide a comprehensive school-based system. And this does also include our partnership with CPA and um, really exploring ways that we can continue to par partner with them and tap into them as a resource. Um, and we are working to increase the number of interventions that we're able to provide for students in response to issues. And one of the biggest things is just really helping students know how to access support when they need it and how to identify um, with a peer when they do see an issue, what did they do? Um, you know, what's an appropriate way to try to, to help their, their friend, their um, peer access that help um, on a more immediate fashion. So again, trying to think about being proactive and responsive. Um, so this is again a universal and many of the students who are um, statutorily at risk um, would fall into the category as far as needing, you know, this social emotional support. Um, so the mental health grant we are anticipating again is going to help us really um, support students so they don't get to that list. What's YRBS? Um, youth risk behavior survey. Thank you. Yes. So the changes here in reporting also corrections that's required by the state or so we just um, we... when you look at the um, when you go back if a student is um, uh, if they are adjudicated then they should be part of the report. So um, we are really responsible for students um, who are at the Milwaukee House of Corrections. They are obviously adjudicated. So, so yes, um, we are including them in the report. And I mean, unfortunately, like next year when we come back to the table with this report, like if you looked at the same 11 students, you know, I don't know that we'll be able to necessarily see a reduction there because again of the the fluctuation in terms of the um, the population but we do believe that it's important that we keep this um, out in front of us keep this state these are students mm -hmm. and when you think about equity it's just important that they're part of our planning but the 58 the 58 number does not include the house of corrections students is that correct that's correct so, yep so they're not really part of the report is that I mean, they are, we, we've talked about them, but. Yeah. Um, I, I also would wonder the list of programming that you listed, can that touch them at all? The, all the different things that we're doing? Can, can that touch the House of Corrections? corrections? Um, not necessarily, um, but it's still, it's still our job to continue to learn about how we can meet their needs. One so. of the most significant ways that our programming does touch them is that a large portion of the student population there have individualized education plans. Mm -hmm. They're students that are 
recognized as having a disability. So we, our staff there does meet all of the needs in their individualized education plan. So they are getting that very big level of support, but they don't have access to some of the other programming that's accurate. And some of it is just, again, you know, we, we're trying to do what we can within the parameters. Um, and some of those, some of the barriers to learning maybe, again, are outside of our system, but uh, we're working hard to figure out a way to do everything that we can. And Dr. Mo has been um, really working hard to kind of think outside the box a little bit and, again, find ways that we can continue to work with, with students at the House of Correction so they have a fair opportunity coming from us. Um. So these numbers are sort of alarming. Um, it's gone from 7, 6, 10, and the last year it was 26, and this year this year the number is 58. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'm missing something. Have the statutes changed? Have they gotten more, um, have the statutes gotten tighter in terms of who we report? Um, or or should, I be, should I be alarmed? This number is large. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And, um, you know, I, I, hopefully that number 58 will go down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know there's been COVID issues. I know, I know um, you know, there's uh, possible problems with quarantining and, and, and kids not getting that education um, as they're quarantined, although quarantine numbers are, seem to be down this year. At any rate, it's alarming. Um, and maybe, maybe you can talk about um, why it, some reasons we think the numbers are this large mm -hmm. in one year yeah, or so if I'm just being an alarmist. <laughs> um, I agree they've gone up. This is my third year working on this report um, either with our high school school psychologist or the previous social worker now with Anna um, and one thing that I found is the consistency of our data has gotten much better. So for example, this year, so one thing last year was we did not look at any test scores because we didn't have any standardized summative scores from the prior school year. Um, so that was a unique piece of last year's data. And this year we really focused on all students in that below basic or ne in needs of support on both the ACT or the Aspire. Um, I don't know prior to that whether we were looking at students in those categories or a percentile. Um, so we're trying to maintain a consistency and catch more students because the more students we're identifying as at risk, that's more students that are, are having targeted supports and check-ins from our student services staff. So for example, we have a group of about 12. So all of the Franklin High School administrators, all of our counselors, um, Anna is the school social worker and our psychologist that meet and team around all of these students to try to really ensure that they're getting the supports to make sure that they are, are graduating. So while it's alarming that they're at risk, we're hoping that by catching that, we can ensure that when it comes time to graduate, they are graduating with their cohort. So we're casting a bigger net is what you're saying. Yeah. But you also, these are, there are 58 that are stat statutorily mm -hmm. At risk, I, I don't. You, you said there were more that that aren't statu statutorily at risk. Has that number gone up as well? I know we're casting a bigger net, but is, can I try and rephrase your question? Yeah, please. Because I sort of had a similar one. How many students are near at risk? Right, they have only one of the categories. Mm -hmm. How many are knocking on the door of being statutorily at risk? That's Do you have question. any idea? I'd have to go back, but I could potentially get you that number. Because, yeah, that would be interesting. You would think that if it's a matter of casting a, mm -hmm. a wider net, that that nearer group mm -hmm. would yep. go mm -hmm. down. I think the challenge with that is that we haven't calculated that in prior years. So I'd have to go, you know, I don't want to get you more than just this year's data yep. for that to sure. feel like sure. we're comparing apples that to you're apples. Asking, well, yeah, I'm trying, to cap, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to compare apples to apples, yeah. but I'm also, right. you know, um, it's important that the, that we're also we're also doing a reasonable job of getting those numbers. We're 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 seeing these at-risk people, and, and and we're we're getting them. We're we're getting a good portion of them to the finish line, which mm -hmm. I think is to be applauded. I, I'm just worried that mm -hmm. there's more and more 
at risk and you know if that's because we're casting a bigger net that's great but yeah, and I, again I think part of this too is I hate to always say well COVID but when you think about it, if you have students who may have had, you know, might have qualified, like you're saying, that student on the edge. So there's one student um, who may have been habitually truant the year before, and then COVID comes along in March, and, you know, so there isn't like that stability. And so if they're already kind of a, you know, if they have one thing, I guess, kind of working against them, and then we don't, they don't necessarily have access, you know, consistently to staff members, um, again, or the instruction. It's, it was, it's just, I think it, we have to acknowledge that that mm -hmm. probably, you know, we're going to see that impact for a little while, and we also are responsible for then how are we responding. And I think too, I mean, we did have still a 58% decrease during that time as well. So we, you know, we were able to still continue to meet the needs of, um, you know, a significant number of students as well. But we agree, we don't, we don't want to see those numbers increase by any means. So that's what I was just going to say. Yeah. Is that if you look back historically, we always, I say we, but like the district, yep. the, the staff, the teams that are working on this consistently are making incredible progress. Even, mm -hmm. you know, when we had seven, I expect you look back, this is 10 years worth of data. I don't have any doubt that our 58 will go down by the end of this mm -hmm. year based on everything they've done in previous years. Yeah. So. And, you know, there's a recognition that there's an increase in mental health issues with, yeah. with youth and adults. And, you know, we have grant dollars to address that. And there's going to be more dollars mm -hmm. coming from the state to address mental health issues. So it isn't, it isn't just Franklin. It's certainly yeah. an issue that we have to be really aware of. And we have to mm -hmm. respond and apply for these grants and support our students and through this grant we're learning a lot more about um, the kind of data like that we can gather um, to identify students who have needs we're learning more about um, again the interventions um, and ways that we can provide services in, in ways that we maybe couldn't before again so that we have more students able to access the supports that they need and then again how are we monitoring that progress so what I see through this grant is again, you know, like we're, we should be able to really refine our, capa our abilities as a system, you know, to recognize some of these needs even earlier, um, rather than even letting them get to this point in high school where we have some of these needs in front of us. So, I think the thing that um, worries me the most um, is the fact that of the 58 students, 21 are seniors. Right, so we have a very narrow window to get those kids mm -hmm. across the finish line. Do we hear back from you at any point during the year? Is there a way to get an update on the status of, I mean, all of the kids, but especially those seniors? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable thing to ask or? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a reasonable thing mm -hmm. to ask. No, we don't generally, in the past, mm -hmm. we haven't come back to this at-risk report until next fall, but I think it's a reasonable thing to keep our, since the numbers seem to be larger, mm -hmm. um, I know you're looking at it, but it'd be nice, it'd be nice for us to hear about it um, sure. at some point. Especially since the ultimate goal is to get them graduated, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. And back on track. For yeah. the, mm -hmm. uh, yes. I think a natural point would be at semester once that first like formalized grading period has passed. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. This is yeah. um, all right, I'm looking for a motion to approve the 2021-22 at-risk report as presented. So moved. Second. All right, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, item D, Community and Recreation Department report. Uh, Mr. Anderson, please.
Thank you for having me here tonight to talk about our recreation department. A um, few things that I want to touch on uh, the report that you guys have all seen is that uh, the first year uh, prior to COVID, the 1819 programming year, you can see what the numbers were not only for that but for facility usage. You can see programming is down last year up 71% from that. Um, we had the mandatory shutdown in March. Um, programming was slow the following year as well. Um, our before and after school program had a couple kids in it. We were cohorting kids. Um, parents weren't comfortable sending kids back. So programming has picked up since then. This, this fiscal year we're going into right now, our numbers are up. Our before and after school numbers are above what they were previously to that. Um, we've got 50, 60 kids attending the programs regularly in the before and after school program, the care programs. Um, the other thing that it shows on page four and five are the graphs that are in the report. Those categories that you see there um, by, pers by uh, enrollments um, are made up of the table of contents and the rec guide. So there's multiple classes that make up that individual category, like in the arts and crafts. The crafts could be painting. It could have been uh, uh, ceramics. It could be classes like that that make up the arts and crafts itself. So these are placeholders in the rec guide when you look at the table of contents. The other thing that I wanted to touch on um, is facilities. Um, you can look at that. The 18-19 year, you see what a, a regular year looked like. The following year, um, up until March, we did that. We did not allow groups back in the building. We, the district is effectively shut down at that point. Coming back into that school year, uh, you can look at um, the next year that numbers did go up. Athletics um, had played a huge part in that at those schools. Uh, the POMS team was out at uh, Pleasant View still at the elementary school, so you'll see those numbers are up a little bit. Um, the other thing that happened with the WI regulation changes over the years with out of season contact, you're seeing spring sports going into the large gyms in the wintertime to have practices. So those teams are still doing that. So when you look at that, um, that second year on the graph, or third year, those numbers are up due to the fact that athletics was still happening at the high school level. Um, there were still some adult classes that happened, um, fitness classes and things like that that happened in the evening. There were no daytime programs up until about September or uh, January of that year um, where we were allowed to do some after school things um, with that. Facilities plays a huge part in overall programming. Um, you can see that right now um, numbers look like they're down, but coming into this next school year, anybody that had a permit um, previously, uh, it could be feeder groups, it could be community groups, those numbers are back up again. Uh, so when we hit September going now into the winter months, we will be at 100% capacity like we had been before. Um, and going along with that, uh, Mr. Hine had given his report last week, and you saw that a lot of the coaches now are not teachers in the building, so they're practicing at 530. Um, they can't get all their practice time in at the high school, so you're seeing them using the elementary school and the middle school for practices, coupled with the recreation department programming again, coupled with feeder teams wanting to get back in, PTO, PTA scout, our, uh, scout groups getting back up and running. Um, there's going to be, we've talked capacity here for years, you're going to see some groups potentially being sh kind of shaken out at the backside of this where they're not going to get gym time that have had it in the past. Athletics plays a huge part, it's great, it's growing, but they're having to leave the high school due to facilities um, to get their practices in for their teams. Um, just wanted to make you aware of that, that that's one of the things with COVID that happened. A lot of these athletic teams have found homes in these gyms now for a year and they're, they're continuing to practice in them. Um, the other thing with, in this report was the department history. Um, the district took over the, uh, our department in 1992 from the city. Uh, the first levy was in 1993. Um, the next thing was we did a five-year strategic plan that brought along the, uh, the concept of community education and we put the definition there of community education um, that allowed for some training for our staff to look into this. Um, the next year we wrote a grant, a 21st Century After Schools Learning Centers grant. That was funded over three years, uh, $600,000 in total. There was a huge component in that for training. Um, all of my staff went. At one point, we had all the custodians, secretaries, building principals, our superintendent had gone through the training. Um, that helped further um, community education to the point where it was included in the name of the department. Um, in 1999, the city of Franklin agreed to take over the permit only, or the, the levy only, for the, the recreation depart, department. 
you got to remember that there's three school districts in Franklin. So when we would have programs, if you lived in the city of Franklin, but you went to Franklin Oak Creek School District, you could not register as if you were a school district resident because you were considered a non-resident. Mm -hmm. So the city uh, started issuing the levy for us. They did that for three years. And then after that, their uh, laws changed what they could do for funding. That was given back to the school district then. Um, during that time, uh, Fund 80, or the Community Service Levy, was put in place. That's what you're, we currently levy at this point. Um, so that's the current levy system that um, does not compete with educating kids. So if, if our levy goes up or goes down, that does not do anything for educating kids. The other important part that I wanted to make is that the levy that you see and that you approve every year at the annual meeting um, is not 100% given to our department for programming. About two-thirds of that supports the community access to buildings. That could be in custodial wages, that could be in electric fees, that could be in cleaning, uh, COVID supplies. It was also for pool supplies when we operated the pool. So we, we do get a portion of that to, to help with programming, but that money that's put in through the levy uh, guarantees access for taxpayers, who that may be the only thing that they get from the school district or the only access they have to the school district. So that's very important. Uh, 2007, our department was recognized as the outstanding organization by the National Center, our Community Education Association. In 2010, the school board changed policy 3010 to allow the recreation department to uh, collect for a fund balance. Um, with that, we've done help with renovations of the pool at the high school, the high school gym, playground equipment, and renovating our own office space. Uh, in the winter of 2018, we did a community needs assessment. Um, some of the graphs on the next page, you'll see some interesting results that came out of that. 81% of non-parent groups wanted expanded programming for senior citizens. Um, another interesting point was 51% of groups identified as non-parents, non-staff, and 69% of groups identified as 65 and over wanted these offers um, during the school day hours. So there's some interesting information that was linked into this report. Um, that kind of takes us to the next point where we're at, which is we need space. Uh, we need dedicated programming space for our department. Um, we've talked about it uh, with the board over the years, last five years. Pre-COVID, we started planning for it. Uh, COVID happened, everything kind of shut down. We're back here again tonight, knowing that coming out of COVID, everything is gonna get back to where it was before. We already see there's gonna be capacity issues for facilities, which will damper what we can do for not only evenings. We do not have really any daytime programming. We've got a class or two at Ben Franklin uh, because there's some space there and they have the ability to lock that section of the building off for security reasons. So we're back here again tonight looking to potentially get back up to planning and looking at uh, something to do with facilities. Um, we need to address that issue. That would not only address our mission statement, but it would be the next steps that was listed in that needs assessment um, for looking at programming space and doing that during the times identified within this report. So I don't know if you have any questions. What is, what are you, when you say program space, what do you mean? What do I mean? Yeah, is it? We need gym? dedicated space. We, for my department, I don't need gym time. I need large spaces. Um, rooms like this um, would be great for exercise classes, multi-purpose type classes. I could wheel stuff out. I could have a senior computer class in here. Size like this, something either added on to the ECC Luxembourg Garden site was bought for expansion. Um, so it could be space like that. It could be a standalone facility there. Um, but we need space during the daytime, especially senior citizen programming that we, we don't do hardly anything with. We don't do anything really for young adults. Um, we miss that age group of middle school, high school kids. So to have a space where they could come hang out, do things, that's a huge need for us. Um, and the trickle down effect of that is we're operating some of these programs and spaces that could be utilized by the athletic department and or the community. We're in multi-purpose rooms, we're in some gyms. If, if we were able to move our programs to a facility, that would have a trickle down effect. That would not answer by any means the needs at the high school um, for space that they need there. Mm -hmm. But for, our, for us, we need space. We need dedicated programming space that we keep the calendar. We're the first ones to put that information in. Aren't we the calendar keeper right now? Recreation department is, yes. So but you already, your policy, have, you already have control of the calendar. Right, but policy 3630 has windows that groups get to book in. So in that window that we are in, 
You also have athletics, school sponsored events, all the school calendars, and you have the buildings and grounds uh, maintenance. So we're competing with all of those groups to get our programs in. So if we want to expand, I can't infringe on athletics. If the, the custodians need to fix something, there's a trickle down that shuts all that down as well. Well, here's where I'm at. You know, I think we built the recreational program. I mean, I feel it's the city's responsibility. I understand that there was, there are facilities, so you were conducting these programs in, in the facilities. But I feel the reason they're in the facilities is because it's taxpayer paid space and it's not being used during the hours that you pro doing your programs. We build buildings for schools. That's our core mission is to educate kids. Recreation is not our core mission, but we have excess space in other outside hours. And I'm all for using those spaces to provide access to the public. But once you build your own facility, you're no longer doing it outside your core mission. So you are in effect spending more, whereas before you were just, there wasn't the more to it because you already had the building. But now when we build our own the facility just for recreation, we're spending more. And when I look around at all the, all the spaces that we have, the rock, sports complex, we have a library that provides excellent programming space. Why would we do this? Why isn't it enough to have what we have? Well, because and work with partners. It baffles my mind that you, we no longer, well, we don't provide swim lessons because we went to our partner. Uh, and the other factor that's important to consider is that we have private entities that operate in this space of recreation. And we're going to be another person in this space providing these classes and things you're talking about. It's kind of not, it's not pro-business. It's competing. And then also, you talk can, about. Can you answer the question? Yeah, Linda. He, he, yeah, the, the, the partners that you've talked about, The Rock, they're, they're not giving us space. We would have to rent. They do a great business all on their own. The sports complex was closed during COVID. It's a pay to play there. So these partners that you think that we have that we can go to to use, we can't. That's to, to say that we're gonna compete with pro business. There's a lot of people that don't wanna go to health clubs that we charge a recreation levy tax for that have just as much a right to be able to take programs as people who have kids in the school. And we are part of the school, like it or not, we are. So that, that's like saying you would build a building, but you don't think the kitchen should get any bigger. We've used the spaces that are allocated out there. We manage the calendar, but the city's growing. So is the school district. The, it's a great problem to have that your community wants to use your buildings. You, you've got people that don't have kids in here that play pickleball, that have their condo association meetings, that have all kinds of things that are happening here in the schools. So to say we, that well, in our, in our, we wouldn't charge more. I mean, we would use our fund balance. There's land. I mean, it's, it's, there's not going to be an impact on the taxpayer. We, we bought the land with taxpayer money. We, we, the taxpayers have paid for it. Another factor is that seniors over 65, I mean, silver sneakers, they can take their money and go to any gym they want to. But I it think doesn't cost them anything. Right, but they come here. I mean, right. they, they take Not everyone can afford that. Or do they want to leave their community to go to it? Seniors, uh, silver sneakers is, there is no fee. We, we talked about. Um, not everybody gets it. Just this might, it sounds like um, there's a lack of uh, common understanding of what the facility use situation is. Um, like Linda, it sounds to me like um, you believe that there are lots of rooms sitting empty waiting to be used. No, I feel that they should be used to the max, but once they're full, we make priorities and, and change. And we don't need to build a facility just for recreation. The city should do that. Well, we are, but we own, <laughs> We, that is part of our we job. Are the city. Right, yeah, right now, um, that as program as is our goes. responsibility. So, and Mr. Anderson, um, you, for 2018-19, um, the revenue was uh, 1.7 million and, and the expenditures were 1.4. Uh, 
um, does that mean that um, does that mean that there was three hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars I don't know if I said that correctly um, that would have gone into a fund balance basically so if and and so it would take us ten years say to build a three million dollar building is that the is that yeah, th there's some money currently in the fund balance for the recreation department, but you're right. I mean, we would look at it as what would the building look like? What can we afford? What pieces are most important priority-wise due to the, the needs assessment that we did and build it in sections? We couldn't afford a five, six, seven million dollar building. That That's not something we're looking to do. We're looking to do something small in addition, something like that, or if there was a small standalone building that could be added onto in the future when we had enough in the fund balance and the needs that that addition would match what the community needs. So that's exactly what we're looking at doing. The, the what generates the fund balance? Why do you have more revenue than expenditures consistently year over year? Because the programs that we run uh, from a, a standpoint of, of breaking even, hitting our minimums, more people take it than that. Are we reflecting the full cost of those programs in your fund? Are we, I'm sorry, what? Are you reflecting the full cost of those programs in the fund? The cost of the facility, of the space? Yeah, the space is in there, but you've got to remember that the district recoups kind of the overhead cost in the fund, the community service levy. So those types of things aren't put into saying there's a charge for electric, there's a charge for custodial. That's the, the money that's recouped out of some of the levy. So you're saying the money in the levy, and I, I don't know what the levy is um, offhand, but say if it's $2 million, so... Um, so 600, 600,000 of that goes back to custodial fees, uh, pays for, pays for the overhead basically. Correct. The, the levy and if you yeah. have a class of 15, um, you have to have a minimum of 15 people in order to make the class go. Um, instead 22 people sign up for it. So you're making the, the extras, the extra is profit which could be put into a fund balance, which could build buildings so that we could have more programming. Correct. But where's, so the fund, part of the levy, it's like 300,000, isn't that what it is? 300,000? Well, the levy's roughly 600, 600 and okay. some thousand dollars. So, and about a third of that comes to the rec So 200,000, so, so are the costs then charged to the fund, Jim? Do they go in there? Or does all the levy their, just go in there? All of their expenditures go into their fund. So all of the costs of their program go into that fund. I guess I still don't, so then what really, Jim, so you're saying that, that 300,000 hour variance that we saw last year, the last real year, was related to classes that were over 15 minimum. Classes that were over minimum, that was the last full year we had programming. So our before and after school program did very well with the care program. Our youth sports did well with classes. Our fitness classes did well. So it was a year where numbers were up over last year that, that added to a fund balance like COVID hit and you saw when we're not able to run the programs, we lost money, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, the, as, as well as the programs do, it pays the costs and then anything above and beyond that goes into the fund balance. How much of um, your revenue is related to kids club? Is related to what? Kids club. Before and after school. Um, probably, if you throw the, the kids camp, the summer program into it, uh, revenues wise, it's probably 40 to 50%. And that's a good point. Like as much as we could speculate that the rec department is only touching non school age kids, that's a huge service that a lot of families depend on to run their lives. Right. And, and that, that program has grown over the years and the students that we take in, we're all inclusive. I mean, we've got kids with IEPs, 504s. I work with Mrs. Cody all the time on kids that are coming in and trying to get EAs and trying to have our program match the school day so that kid has a great experience in the morning to begin his day, and when they go home, the next day, it's, it's a positive day for the child. It's a great service. It costs money. Mm -hmm. I do we're think providing it. I do think it's worth as we are continuing to talk about this, sort of stepping back and saying, 
are things the same? And I would like to see the community needs assessment. I wasn't on the board in 2018, so I would love to see a copy of that. If attached we could. in this document. Oh, the, the entirety of it was? Yeah. Like the number of people surveyed yep. and, oh, I didn't see the number there, of people there surveyed. There was a link. It was on the link? It okay, link. fabulous, thanks. Um, just wondering if there have been any changes in the community. Like I saw that there is gonna be a, a YMCA facility, I don't know. Do, Coming to town? No, did I imagine that? No. no, but they also did refer to the silver sneakers in there, and they the comment was they weren't sure silver sneakers would be allowed to be there. So, so I do think this is worth. Um, I, I disagree with you, Linda, that we don't have a responsibility to maintain the rec department for the seventy five percent of taxpayers in this community who don't have kids in the pool. I'm not proposing we eliminate the rec department. I'm just saying that we're. We're drawing a line. We're, we're finding out what enough is instead of more. How about enough? Well, also, I might say that was, don't we need more as our community grows, <laughs> as our community's needs grow? Do we not need more to service our community that is paying into the levy? We are, and I, I really uh, yeah. appreciate, Brad, um, the chronological order that you gave us when things happened in 1992. We got the rec department. And I, I, I smiled when you said in 2010, the rec department started their fund balance, because that was a point I had made to you, Mrs. Wachowski, that talking about building a building for our recreation department is not a new idea. And you were not blindsided by that because in 2010, that's when that fund balance started. Because I know from my own experience and from my longevity on this board, that that balance was there and that talk was had before. It was not a new idea. How much money is in that? Um how much money is in that fund balance, Mr. Milzer? Uh, give me a minute. Okay. I'll, I'll take a look. I will say, you know, in today's world here, every complex that we build in Franklin has got their own gym space and programming space for the people that live there. Every don't say they don't. They complex. have little gyms in all of these places. We're not building a gym. I, I, don't, I don't want to build a gym for the rec department. I want to build programming space that's multi-use. I'm not looking to build a gym. I think that's what they have in their spaces too, multi-use. What, what senior, spaces? Senior spaces, senior living um, so maybe communities, that's, they, that's what they do. But it's what, not only for the senior living communities. You know, I mean, if you've got a, a scout troop that wants to have a space where they can set up a bunch of tables and do their scout project, mm -hmm. that could be in the community, rec, you know, in a community uh, new building as well. Scout like, programs are usually sponsored by already community-based groups, churches, but grade the point schools. Is, is we don't have the space for those spaces, those groups, because we have high school athletes that are using those spaces, which they should have those spaces provided to them by the school district. But the other community members who need spaces don't have all of those spaces available to them. That's the point. Or so uh, do you want us to say, okay, so we can only have 10 groups, that's it, no more 10 groups? Okay, too bad, sorry. I, I, I don't understand that thinking. We are here to service the community. This is, this is my thinking. Thank you for asking. But you did say that high school groups used to be at the high school. Now they're, they're, they're different places. They're everywhere, Linda. So doesn't that, when they left, that space didn't go away. No, because that space is filled by another athletic group. Perhaps this might be a, a useful, somehow to, I'm not quite sure how to demonstrate it. Um, having attempted to reserve facility space myself, I am aware of, of the difficulty, um, but I, I have the luxury of that personal experience. So I have also had the luxury of that personal experience. I also experience have, and it thank you, difficult. I have also done two that. Years ago, two years ago, you came here um, and your programming um, had grown by leaps and bounds, it seemed, in the last two years. Um, congratulations and thank you. Um, and it seems as if um, there was a hiccup that we got through. It's more than a hiccup, unfortunately. But we're getting through it and we're getting back to mm -hmm. where we, we're getting back to where we were and it seems like we're going to go ahead quickly. Um, there are, 15 years ago, there was 20 teams and now there's 30 teams or that's, that's not the, that's probably not the right numbers, but the numbers have gone up um, and there's not, there is not a new school. 
except that the middle school is much larger now. It's a huge gym. Um, but huge but we're, gym. we're not talking about just gym facilities. It, it seems as if to serve the community for recreation, it seems as if we need to, um, it seems as if it would serve the community to have a, to, to have something to look forward to in a building that could be used by the entire community. What are you asking for your next step? Like, what are you actually asking for here? We'd like to begin or restart the planning process that we did back in 2019 pre-COVID. We were here at a board meeting and we were asked the question about a building and we said yes. We talked about our fund balance at that. We had started some initial planning. That planning stopped with COVID. So we would like to restart that planning to look at addressing the needs that were kind of outlined in this report with the needs assessment and some of those things so that, like you're saying, we're coming out of this. We know we're at capacity facility-wise for our large spaces already. That's a given. I, we keep the calendar. The, the programming we're doing is, is almost back to where it was pre-COVID. If we delay this another year or two, you're going to have people here that were groups that are going to be mad that the expansion with athletics and some of the rec programming that we would like to expand that we don't is kick groups out that are taxpayers that the only thing that they have is coming into the school district. So we would like to be proactive and actually get back to planning and figure out one, what we can afford and how long it's going to take us to get to that point to, to hit our mission and to, to hit what was in the needs assessment and put that plan together. So if we allow Mr. Anderson to begin exploring a plan, are we committing to pouring a concrete foundation tomorrow? No, I think it's reasonable to allow, I think it's reasonable. Jim, what is the current fund balance? Uh, I, I don't have the exact number, but I believe it's about 2 million between okay. the two funds. That, that that's, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted a ballpark. I don't need a specific And could that number. money be used for anything else? Uh, it could be used for anything that relates to recreation that they're doing and anything in our policy. So we could build a new pool with it? Uh, if, if you were going to have the community use the pool exclusively uh, and not our students, then you could do that, otherwise not. This is rec money. Yes. Do we get a new pool? It would be very nice to have a new pool. Uh, thank you. I think it would be nice to have a, our own personal space for recreation also, but I'm here as a fiscal conservative and say, when is enough enough? And what about the city? You, we paid impact fees for recreational purposes. What did they do? They have a, a fund balance over there, $2 million, if not more. Well, that's a larger question of, is this, uh, is this a time to consider having conversations with the city about a different relationship in terms of the recreation department? Certainly other cities have a parks and recreation department. I'm not personally interested in, you know, I, I'm not quite sure how we would do that, but, um, if you want to explore it, Linda, I'm, I'm willing to hear it. I agree. I think that I think that it's a separate question on whether, uh, yes, it would be fantastic if the city partnered with us in this. Um, I mean, we are the city's partners. As far as as far as people know, they pay yeah. they pay taxes. They pay taxes to the city. Some of them some of them go to the city. Some of them go to the schools. Some of them go to the community rec. Um, so yes, um, it, it, I think it behooves us to talk to to talk to the city about that. But that doesn't mean that the two million dollars we have should sit in a sit in a fund balance and go to exactly what I don't know. I mean, Mr. Anderson, how long have you run this department? Twenty nine years. So I, you, the board has seemed pretty pleased with his performance, and so I think it's it, it's reasonable to allow him this latitude to make a recommendation. Well, I think we should, and also look at alternatives. I think that's also important to do. Okay. And um, working with the city would be kind of a first step, would it? To ask and, that? and I had that in here that if if we were allowed to start planning, we would talk to the city about their impact fees. 
Um, we did that to, prior to with a previous mayor, and those talks didn't get very far. There needs to be a match, and there's a whole thing of does the city need to own the building. There's there are some other parameters that go in with that, but it's definitely something that we would revisit because, like you're saying, if, if we have two million and they would match that, and the district had control of the facility, you might be that much closer to being able to do something. Yeah, that's good. So, so is that something you would own, sort of setting up those? I would work with Mr. Milzer and and. Dr. Miller with trying to, to look into that, absolutely. Do we currently use any city facilities for our programming? <sighs> On a limited basis. We were grandfathered tennis courts from when I was here before. We cannot expand that time or the days. Um, so we're limited to the number of kids we can put through that. Um, some community members went in and wanted tennis courts uh, turned into pickleball courts. We, we helped with that. Um, other than that, no. The, the library, we've got some programs in there, but they do not permit on a consistent basis, so you can't run continual programs same day, same time. You can't permit parks um, for baseball fields, softball fields, tennis courts. So we're kind of grandfathered with the two tennis courts out of three at Lions Legend um, from 9 to 11, and that's what we fit our tennis lessons in. So really, no, there, there isn't much we use with the city. Well, is it time to ask for more? We, I mean, we all pay taxes. We're not a low tax paying district. And, and we can do so that. So let's try do and that. do our best to share. Right, we do that every year, but those are outdoor facilities. That doesn't still answer the question of trying to get indoor programming space. They've got pavilions that you can't do anything with because they're all set up for picnics and things. That's not what this request was for. I mean, I would love to go there. We go every year because we've got to go back and ask for the tennis courts, and we're told no. So, so we do do that. So does Mr. Anderson need a motion or does he need permission from the board to start exploring those options and then return to the board with a report on what his findings are? How does that, how do we do something are like that? Are we looking for consensus to move forward? You, you could, you could um, work towards consensus, although I'm not sure you'll <laughs> achieve that this evening. You cannot vote. It is not identified as an action item this evening. Um, so um, it would have to come back to the board um, as an action item uh, if you wanted to make a motion to direct him to proceed with planning that was in place, has been in place. So essentially your vote would be to tell him to discontinue to doing what, you know, he's been set out to do since 2010. So um, I know that's complex, but um, another alternative is continue to move forward with this planning and bring those plans to the board so that the board could see those plans and at any point where it's, you know, more clear what this would look like, then the board could take a vote before any further dollars would be spent. So the I'm only sure motion Mr. that, the only, motion that we could, the only motion that we could put on the table is one to discontinue mm -hmm. this. Well, I would, I because, would say because the board gave permission in mm -hmm. 2019 to move forward with planning. There, there was a um, uh, agreement by the board to accumulate a fund balance, and over the years, the discussion has been annually to provide more space for programming. That's what the the fund balance would be going towards. So, in my mind, if you're going to do something different, then the board would act upon that. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm thinking about it right now. But again, Ms. Um, Mr. Anderson could proceed with um, using some of the fund balance to get some of those preliminary plans together, bringing that to the board and before, you know, major dollars would be spent mm -hmm. on anything, the board would be able to weigh in. Again, Mr. Milzer, would you like to add to that? And then uh, Ms. Wachowski. Yeah, I believe that's uh, the correct way to proceed. There, there, there has not been a vote by the board on this. Mm -mm. Each time uh, Mr. Anderson has come, uh, the, the board has asked questions. He's indicated what he's working on, and they've been good with that. Uh, this is the first time I think we've had a discussion of not doing this. So um, it, in the absence of having really nothing to look at, I think it would be a good idea for him to put together the plan and bring the plan back and then have the board look at that and decide if that's something they're interested in. I think that's a great idea. And you would also be working with Mr. Milzer for the financial end of the what you were looking yep, at. Absolutely. I have another follow-up question. That sounds great. great. Please. So, you know, we did a lot of planning with the, the new, middle, new middle school, sizing the gym, the spaces. 
we we resurrect the department and those needs. I, we do have some dedicated space in there, do we not? Some cycling room or but wh where was right. the planning during that? We were at those, but the priority was to build a middle school. Um, the gym isn't what we're talking about. What are we so talking about? I'm, I'm confused. We're talking about large rooms, large spaces. What types of types of programs? Can you give us an sure, example? Sure, it would I be. Mean, classrooms are available at night. Those no, are large I, spaces. I'm not just talking. It would be a room like this that had storage where you could have seniors in playing cards. You could have an arts and crafts. I could run a Zumba class in here. I could run a pound class in here. I could also have a parent-child stretch class with infants. Things like that that are they're taking place in large spaces, not classrooms. Things that could run during the day. Things that require equipment? Some equipment, right, that would have storage that, that's portable that can be in. So it's a multi-use couple rooms that would be available. But it's also available to offer services to seniors. Health department come over to do blood screenings. We've got Love Thy Neighbor group that's looking for space to do lecture series for seniors, how to stay in their homes, welfare. I mean, there's, there's a myriad of things that are out there that we've been asked to do that we can't. And we don't have space to do it. There are also reasons not to put, not to put, add something on with to the middle school with that sort of planning because the only daytime the only daytime programming in the schools that we have at this point is at Ben Franklin because we can lock off that part of the school that's with the way safety is in schools at this point it's almost impossible to provide those type of spaces unless it's a standalone facility during the day. But we're doing it at Ben Franklin. We are doing it at Ben Franklin. There's two classes at Ben Franklin, two senior and, classes. And we built a brand new middle school that we could have designed it all in there. Well, we were at those meetings and we talked about the gym space. And the gym space, that's what got the eight or nine courts of pickleball. That's what has three gyms now for Saturday basketball. That's what's also accommodating pickleball on Sundays that's grown. So we, we, did, we were part of those meetings. The cycling you've talked about, we chipped in for some of those bikes so that we could do some, some classes there in the evening. We're, we're looking for that daytime programming space. And those two classes that we run in Ben Franklin, there's many more than just those two that we're looking to try and run. We used to have a lot of them. We used to have space at Countrydale during the day in, in two classrooms that were, was renovated. That got outgrown and security issues. It, Perhaps when you come back to us um, with your proposal, you could include sort of a, an example of how this would be used, like l literally mock up a weekly schedule and um, to just sort of demonstrate. And then if we could compare it to um, what spaces are available in the district at those times, um, just to sort of make sure that we are not creating a need where there isn't one. Um, it might also be a useful exercise just to do a brief survey of what of its facilities are available specifically for seniors in this community, just out of curiosity. You know, I don't know what percentage of people consider, considered seniors actually live in some of these um, more luxurious new communities that have been built that do have the facilities, but I, I don't think it's the majority, so. No, and, and we've, we've visited the senior complexes about doing programs, and you get two or three that want to come down and do it, but they want them for free and we've got instructors and things there, or to try and merge two facilities to come over to, to hit the numbers to break even, you need to provide transportation. Mm -hmm. so, so we have hit some of the senior living centers in the past about trying to do programming there to the, take it to them so they don't have to come somewhere because we didn't have facilities. And, and those don't typically work in those facilities. Because One, their community room is small. Secondly, they don't have com the, the amount of computers you'd want, and they don't have enough people at one individual site that want to come down during that time to take a class. Mm -hmm. But if you were able to have six or seven different things feed into to one larger thing, then you could make it work. And that's just at those sites. That's not saying that people okay, would still live in We don't need to houses. solve that right now, but it might just be useful data to have. I think we have to get past having, why is that our facility? Because why we're in charge of the rec department. We can, you know, this is more about programming, not where it is or what the space is. How can you have a program when there's no space? Because uh, I feel that there are spaces that aren't ours, but we don't want to go there. Well, all right. So I mean, we've heard excuses about why it's, they can't do it. It's not that we don't. It's not that. It, it's not that we don't want to go places. Um, every everything you've mentioned, Mr. Anderson has said something. No, we've tried to go there. No, we've tried to go there. No, we've tried to go there. The library. Um, the the uh, the the um, 
the senior living places, the parks, um, the, parks the um, every everything that you've mentioned, he does not. He he has tried to go into those places. I know he's worked with Innovative to get into the pool there. And we he's did it. Trying to solve. Understand that it. he's trying to solve these problems, but at some point there is no facilities for them. And you may think that the city should be doing it, but the city's not going to do it. We should work with the city and try and try to have them have provide for some of it. But they're, they're, this, the city has Franklin has decided that the that the school district is in charge of the rec department, and and so we are. And that's not going to change. It has changed. It wasn't always. President well, since Brock, I would say that we've gone around and around I feel, on this. I, know, I feel that this is a dead issue, and I and I'm very offended that we have allowed Mrs. Woodkowski to run this meeting and this portion of the meeting. And I think that it is time to move on. We've asked Mr. Anderson to gather his data together. He will be working with Mr. Milzer. He will come back and give us a full report. But this going around and around and this allowing one person to run the meeting is it's not fair anymore it's too much thank you i will we can discuss that in the briefing thank you thanks mr anderson thank you mr anderson thank you. all right item e budget docu bu budget document review discussion um that belongs to me um Although uh, Mr. Alexandrovich, um, I, I know we talked about this, and I know um, I know that you're the treasurer, so um, I would defer to you on on starting on starting the discussion about um, uh, about the budget document. I know for a little um, for a little background, um, we talked about changing the budget document um, earlier this year. Um, the budget document was changed a bit. And um, I think for the better. Um, and I think there is um, that we had talked about revisiting it this year because we want to continue to make the budget document better um, and easier for us to use, easier for the public to use, um, easier um, and and better for transparency. Um, and uh, Mrs. Wachowski has provided a lot of information from other places um, that some people have reviewed, but. Um, um, I, I think we should. Uh, I think we should start the discussion there. Okay, and I honed in on uh, some of the reports that Mrs. Witkowski produced, and uh, she had passed them on to Angela, and then I forwarded them to Ann and Dr. Khan, um, so that we would have an idea of specifically what we were looking for. And uh, I didn't bring that with me because when I looked at the agenda, it said Mr. Sprague. But there was one report that had a lot of oh, had a lot of detail from uh, I think it was Waukesha that had a lot of line items, and then Mrs. Witkowski also said to what were the other two points that you made that you thought were uh, that we could look at too, and I and I agreed that the, that additional information would be helpful. I think um, a more complete staffing report. At, more, this, at this point, we only have teaching and. Just classroom related. Right. We don't have the other pieces that would be the and complete staffing report of what we are paying for. As and we sent out samples of all that to everybody, but we have to get to the point where, as a board, we make the decision on which one of those reports we want to go with. And, I, and I'd want to limit it to like those three. What do you mean by those three? The three that. Um, it's in front of you right there. So I. I um, read through the examples that you gave us, and I think the tricky thing, at least for me, is knowing without sort of you saying specifically, this is what I want to see, as opposed to, or you could say, I want you to create a document exactly like what Waukesha created. That's one thing. I don't know that I agree with that. But I think you need to make a specific, you need to be very specific about what you want, because otherwise you're going to be disappointed. So well, I want to know specifically what you want to see. Specifically what I liked about the Waukesha report is that, well, when we look at our reports, nowhere do we have the actual and the budget right next to each other to see how our budget process is working. What we show is we show the uh, two years ago actual, last year's budget, and this year's budget. So we are comparing a budget to a budget with our 
which are both uh, estimates of what we think is going to happen. And then we show what the differences are, but we don't ever compare how did we do compared to that budget. Okay. Maybe we're just horrible at budgeting. All right. Maybe we're not. I, so, by the so, way, I think Jim does a great job. Yep. But that was something that I, I thought was very important to have. And then the breakout, the details, a lot of line items. So right. A lot of line items. You're going to have to be specific there, right? Because I, I can I imagine there's about 5,000 line items in your budget, or I don't know. Am I imagining? Or I think the level probably closer to 15,000. Okay. So I think the level talent you have right there. You this, want it back? This is this is good. This is I think not overdone, but it has the. I would be very happy to see what's here. Yeah, and it's three I pages. So. You're saying three pages, and what Mrs. Wachowski has is about 12 pages. So no, all no, there's no, three of those others. pages that oh, okay. I'm uh, referring to. I mean, I think it's the level of, I think Jim can relate to what we're asking for in terms of being. You have to be specific. What do you well, want? Well, here's what I know. I know that the state of Wisconsin has the same chart of accounts for every school district. Mm -hmm. So if we could say this right here, whatever's here. Let me see. I didn't bring it with me. So, so you're looking at the school district of Waukesha, there's really like a three page and it lists the, the accounts and then an audited, a budget, an unaudited, and then like the next year's budget. Is that the, is that the document that I'm, that you guys are looking that at? That sounds like the exact document. That was one of the attachments on the email that you sent? Yeah. All right. So if we were to narrow this down and say, could you represent the data that's found on pages six through nine of the Waukesha budget within the budget document you give us? How would you respond to that? I don't have a copy of what you're looking at. Well, that's a fair statement. Well, you do have it, not with you. I don't know you what it is. Not right this second, but theoretically. Because we went over all of this. This is from Waukesha? Yeah. So if they found okay. some line, if the, we identified some line items, because I don't want to, what did you say? Some big number, 15,000? Uh, that would serve only to No one's asking me. for that. It, yeah, no one's asking. Fifteen thousand is probably the chart of accounts, and I'll bet you don't use more than two hundred of those. It's probably every combination. Uh, it, until you get into breakdowns by school, every single school, every single department. Yeah, those additional breakdowns would take you into fifteen thousand. But the ba main chart of accounts, uh, without all those breakdowns, it, there can't be that many. I don't think this thing is, uh, this report is more than 200, and yet it's very ex <coughs> extensive. Uh, the chart of accounts is very extensive. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, there's the fund, there's the object, there's the function, there's the location, there's a project on that, and every one of those numbers can change, and it's a different account. So when you say, if you just did the, I guess there's no breakdown for that. I can see what they've done here, so I, so I understand what you're saying. Okay. But the, the terms you're using don't fit with it. Like, it doesn't mean the same thing to me that it does to you. So when I was asked the question, I thought I was asked the question, like, how many line items do you have? Mm -hmm. Well, I clearly don't know the terms. So I'm sorry if I confused it. No. Okay. Uh, so you're looking under the uh, expenditures piece of it that there's a breakout here on page. What page is page eight? Page eight, like this section right here. Yeah, we're just doing it that way. Okay. Okay. This isn't Waukesha. Okay, maybe it's it's similar. Yeah, it's it. Oh, look at Waukesha. No, okay. Well, this is the Waukesha one. If you want to look at that, it's very similar to the other one you're looking at, I believe. Yeah, I have that and one. I, I think, in my mind, having yeah. having three pages instead of one, and 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 it is, and having a, a bit more information to, for people to digest, is, I think it's a great. I think it's a really good next step. I don't know, and and uh, we talked about this, Mr. Millser, when we were meeting. Um, I, I don't know if that costs you more to produce, um, 
because we have to take the co your the cost of doing it, the cost of providing this report into account, and and maybe it costs maybe it costs zero, maybe it costs fifty thousand. I have no idea, but um, and you know you're not going to be able to tell me the second, but but I, I think that's um, I, I think that's something we have to take into account, and maybe maybe you can provide some background on that. I, I know a lot goes into this report, but I know a lot of it comes from other places. Um, the, the current budget, I know that Jim has to enter in all that data into a spreadsheet to mm -hmm. get what, what we get. And so that's from the books, all manually transferred over. Really? So anything that we're doing here is definitely creating more work. Set up work one time. And well, I think we su suggested to, to Jim that perhaps a consultant would could be brought in and do that for him. And then So coming into this, in the middle of the conversation. Um, it sounds like a lot of perhaps the frustration has just been a disconnect between sort of what you what we think we're asking for and what Mr. Milder is hearing. I, I, I don't know. That's just, that's my interpretation of the situation. So perhaps if we were to go back and say as a next step, what we would really like to see, and again, I defer to you all. I am not a b budget guru. You've been doing this for longer than I. Some of you have experience in the field. So the next step we'd like to see would be the addition of some, some data similar to this. And yes, like Mr. Sprague said, if you tell us it's going to take you 40 extra hours of work to, pro to produce it, amortized over three years, well, that's, that's something to consider. I do agree with Mrs. Wachowski that um, I'm not even sure how to make it happen, but uh, seeing salary data in another way might be useful. So just, just to sort of get a sense of um, how much overall salary money is going to different sort of levels of teachers. I, I don't even know what I, I'm I agree for. with I agree with you, Dr. Beer, in that um, in, in that I think one of the I think my my biggest desire would be to have in in the budget would be to have um, more of a more of a um, report on faculty since 70, 75 to 80 percent of our budget goes to paying um, to paying staff um, and I know we get the numbers and 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 but it doesn't seem to ever we don't ha we don't seem to have all the numbers and maybe we don't need all the numbers but it would be nice to know do we have 120 EAs, or do we have 180? Um, and and do we and, and do we do we need all those? You know, I think that um, you know, do we have uh, five um, five math coaches in the district? And you know that to have that that level of staffing report and have it be with the budget, I think would be um, I, I think would be a, a a great thing to have, and I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's possible in the short term, and and perhaps I'm not making myself very clear in what I'm asking for. But um, well, I don't even. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. And the tricky thing is, I don't know how to use words like whatever it, word. Cost. It's, it seems kind of. But I know how to say. But, for, I but I know how to say. Here's my question. How would you explain that to me with numbers? So I'm happy to write down a list of questions like, well, you know, what's the salary range look like for the teachers in the district? And then you could say, well, here's the best way to represent that numerically in the budget. I, I don't care so much about how it's represented, just that it is. So it sounds to me like you're asking for Mr. Milder and our the HR person, and I apologize, I don't remember you. Laura. 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 Um, <laughs> To work together and give you two separate documents. A document know. saying, here's how many uh, EAs we have, and this is the cost of paying this many EAs. This is how many teachers with master's degrees or whatever yeah. we have. This is how much it's going to cost. Does to that pay sound them. reasonable? Is that what you're asking? I think so. Is and that, that would be asking? paired with a, do a budget document. Yes, that's what I'm asking. And I, and I realize that that is not a. Um, I realize that 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 is a big process. Yeah. That's a yeah. big project. Um, I think it's something we need, but I realize it's a big. I realize it's a big project. 
So if you could have it in two weeks instead of three, that would be great. <laughs> um, no, if, if, if it could be done over the course of time, I think that'd be fantastic. But but um, but in the in the short in, in the short term, I, I think more more of a to go from a one-page report that we're showing to a three-page report within the report that we're showing. And what's the one-page report you're referring to? I'm sorry. To? Uh, extending from what we have now to, Mrs. Wachowski, maybe you can help me with this, from what we have now to what Waukesha has or Menominee Falls has or... Realistically, the numbers that we got in this year's budget are the, the biggest change from last year, the previous year's budget to this year, to my eyes, was a, just a lot more narrative, which I definitely appreciated and explained. But essentially, the meat of the budget, the numbers um, and the budget categories, if that's the right word, that you included were essentially the same ones as the previous year. There weren't a whole lot of new calculations included in the, the budget. Uh, th there were some. Yeah. Uh, but it was about what I what I heard was I want to understand the budget, mm -hmm. and a way to understand the budget is to have those little narratives that yep. explain what's happening in that area yep. so that you can understand it. Which helped me immensely. I, I think it was a I think it was a really good start. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, and I know we've talked about that. Right, right. Okay, uh, so and we I did think say this was a failure to communicate. Well, we did say at the time, like I didn't have time to do this twice. Like, uh, here's what it looks like, and then do you like it, mm -hmm. and I'll fix it, kind of thing. Right, I mean, it was, we were busy doing COVID things, so, and keeping the district running. So, but we did say, we'll talk about it after the budget comes out, and see what changes we need to make. So that, that's the background on what this discussion right. is. Yep. Right. Uh, and, and it's, I, I do want to say, Mr. Milzer, it's a discussion. I, I don't want you to feel like you're being ganged up on. Um, I mean, again, I thought the changes were good, and... I'd just like to continue mm -hmm. changes over time to make it as, as good as it can be. And I think that's what you want. Yeah, and I think it, there are some things that we used to have in the old report that we lost in the new report mm -hmm. because we wanted to throw the old report away. And I think we could get some of that back uh, through working through the HR piece, which we used to have both, but they were in different spots mm -hmm. in there. If we included that all in the HR report, whether it's part of the budget or a second, separate document, uh, we could convey more information, like you're asking for of the how many educational assistants do we have in the district, um, and, and then what does that cost? I think that kind of information is certainly more appropriate, and you can get something out of it, rather than a three-page list of what we spent for medical supplies and food. I, I don't see how that helps you approve a budget of this size. But would it prevent us from approving the budget? Like, what would be the harm of including it? Uh, I believe you'd get a lot more questions even than you had on something like that. I mean, I have questions when I look at the budget for Waukesha. Like, why, why did they spend that? Why did they spend that? Um, but it's all in a part of making the district work. Mm -hmm. And and I think we, as much as we can, we need to stick to the programs we offer. And what does it run? What does it cost to run the programs that we offer? And are we doing the right programs? I, I think that's uh, basic. And if if we can add more information on uh, staffing, especially to that report, to get back some of what we lost and go beyond that, uh, I think that would be helpful to the board uh, in seeing that as well. That's probably a good first step. I, I would like us to go back to simply asking for the, the two pages that, at the, the level of detail that we saw at Waukesha. It does include, under salaries, different categories of personnel costs, clerical, faculty, aid, substitute faculty, custodians. They're all, there's like 10 different levels of staffing. Do you see that, Jim? Yeah. We don't use these same categories. Do have the same document with me? Is the Waukesha example is what you're looking at? Okay, I do have that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I did just send you an email with all the attachments oh, that I'm I sent out to it's Ann. Just, and yeah, Dr. Um, Dr. Oh, okay. I, 
I would like, I mean, if we're going to take another step, it'd be more important for me to see just a little more level of expenditures with the additional salary breakout. And I would like to see all the staffing, not just the. What about this? Before we um, have to utilize a new f format on an actual budget, could we possibly do sort of a trial run just of this, this additional information with our current year's numbers, have us sit down with it, see what kind of questions it generates, see if it is useful, to, if, if, you know, just for sort of a, just to sort of try it out before we take it on, like as like a dress no, rehearsal. There's no dress rehearsal um, because you're putting in, there, there, I mean, there's no dress rehearsal because you can't, you, um, you can't put that information, um, you can't put in that work and then, okay, we'll decide not to do it. It's either we ask for it and it, and it, and we get it or we don't ask for it. There's no, there, there's not, there's not a trial run, I, I, th I think. I, I th think she's saying though that we could tweak it. You're talking about tweaking it, not like, I don't like it, start over. I think it'll be more of a, to your point, incremental. We'll look at this and I think this captures a lot right here. I mean, this is what other districts use. We're not making this up out of nowhere. Other districts. There are a couple of districts that use that. There are districts in our area that just come in with the four page DPI format and that's, that's all the board looks at and they approve that. So I, I wouldn't cast it out that this is the standard. This is very far from the standard. Yeah, I guess that for me, the question of wanting to sort of trial it out was to honestly see if it um, allowed us to make for any more informed decisions or have more informed discussions. If all it does is sort of muddy the, muddy the waters and uh, force us to go down rabbit holes, I'm just going to use metaphors here for the rest of the night. Um, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that that's useful. But if it does prove to be useful, then. Well, and if staffing is where we spend the majority of our money, I think it's valid to have that level of detail added to the budget. I think, you know, your discussion that way. Um, if we have all this information in the budget and the, the new format of the budget with an extra narrative helps everybody kind of understand a little bit better, you know, maybe we add the, the staffing information, but we don't add extra line items. I don't know. Um, if you look at the, the budget that was presented um, by Mr. Milzer on page 21, you'll see categories of employees, guidance, social work, psychologists, salaries, employee benefits, purchase services, non-capital. You'll see the salaries for instruction, curriculum, and assessment. You see salaries for district-wide support direction. You follow through, you see what the salaries are for administration. You see what the salaries are for business services. You see what they are for custodians. So it is in the current document. But I would like to know, so I don't get a sense of sort of what that is per capita. So for example, there are significant differences in the percent increase in salaries across all of those different categories. And I'd like to know, is that because we've hired more people sure. in those categories? Sure. Or are we, yeah. So you want enrollment, uh, excuse me, you want data within this report pertaining to the number of employees we have in these categories. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I wonder if it's, I mean, it, Yes, if, if it's possible to include the staffing report yeah. right next to the, mm -hmm. you well, know, have a link to have a link to the staffing and report. And then I can do the math if we need to, but um, if it can be embedded, that works too. Because yeah, it wouldn't be difficult to identify, you know, in a spreadsheet the number of teachers we had over the last three years and the number of support staff we've yeah. had over three years. That could very well be put in here. Um, it's just currently in a separate report, but we could put that in here. So that when you look at the salaries in these categories over those years, you can pair them with the numbers mm -hmm. of people who we've employed. Yes. So um, I think what's in the Waukesha document in some in some parts, you know, currently exists in the document we have. But we want more information about the the staff. What, who who are we actually employing? To Ms. Wachowski's point, you know, it's the largest portion of our budget. So. How has the number of people we employ changed over the years, and how does that pair with, with these numbers? Yeah, and it has to be more than just the total. It's the kind of employees. Sure, more of a breakdown on by the kind of employees. 
like educational assistance and uh, clerical substitute yeah. teachers, okay. support facility, custodians, maintenance, okay. retirees, student which workers. We, which we actually do have all of those as lump salaries line items in our current budget, right? Like I could tell you the total amount we spend on salaries for custodians in the district. I just don't know how many custodians we have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's in there. You're assuming then that the program custodial services only has custodians in that program. That's, and it very a, well could have. That's a fair point. It could have a non -custodian. Managers in there, the clerical support. Good point, yep. Good point. All right, so next steps. Um, I, I still would like to get a little, this is not asking a lot. General fund has got two, two pages and particularly the revenues are more understandable if we had a little more breakdown and more consistency. Difference? I would say we've been very consistent. It's been consistent yes. in the way we've showed the revenue. Been, uh, although we get changes that are explained by, well, PPI changes. We had to move this over here. So uh, to your point, consistent, I could point out that there's been changes that are not decision related with changes, but just accounting changes that come through. Which we have to do. Yeah. yeah. But okay. we can restate those to give better information in terms of where we're going as a district. It would be more, it would be more, it's just better information to restate and then show the change. It's not something accountants don't do. Um, Earlier, you mentioned a desire to have um, the numbers about actual versus budgeted. What right. what do we think about that, Mr. Milzer? Is that a reasonable column to include? Like, do you want it just from the pre? I mean, we have actual from the previous year, don't we? Just After the year is done yeah. in Got it. August, so uh, we maybe have actual like for two the previous years of year. actual, so we can have a more static number to compare to, like for a year that's completely closed out. Yeah, they have audited and then they have a budget for the next year, an unaudited actual, so, and then a budget. And so that, what about that? An additional mm -hmm. column for actual, AKA audited from a year that's been closed out? So for the previous year, you would show both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Okay, so we've made some progress, that's good. I, I think we can have three pages of general fund that has a little more level detail. Can you make a list of what's specific? The same as we said Waukesha. Alan, you said yeah, Waukesha. Waukesha. Same as Waukesha. Same thing, revenue, expenditures, general fund. For the general fund and I'm assuming once you get that program, it can be run across oh any goodness. fund. I'm just going to suggest that until you are like very specifically write down, don't reference other documents until you specifically say, these are the items I would like. It's you're, it's probably you'll probably be disappointed. And I think in addition to that, you should have a list of what you want changed. But then that has to also be something that we all agree upon. Right. We can't make these changes to a budget document because only one of us wants that. I think we should get a, you know, a list of what your changes are, what your expectations are, and then I think as a board, as seven of us, we need to look at it and then make that decision as a group, not just what one person wants. I think I, I'm bringing this to you. I think Alan also agrees. School District of Waukesha, three pages. It was shared with you. It's very specific. Columns. It's. I don't know what more you want me to bring to you. I would like you to send me the. So you've sent me about eight different documents, and I apologize if I didn't pull out the exactly right thing. But I would love it if you could specifically go through and highlight exactly what items you would want that were not included. So some of these things are in our budget. Okay, I know that sounds like a lot of a lot of work, but Mrs. Larson, what if anything would you like to see improved, um, changed? I'm satisfied with the budget document as it's presented. However, I really would like to see that um, the HR information included in that document. So I'd like to see those two um, documents paired with each other. That would be my request. So I think, I think there's, I, I think there's consensus that the HR, the HR data is. Can we be is, specific on what we're asking for? Is there an example? 
I, what specifically are we asking for? Uh, the number of teachers employed in, or the number of personnel employed in each category that we have a line item uh, that we have a budgeted dollar amount for. An FTE account or is there, is there positions? Yeah. We could do well, it either uh, by FTEs it, or by bodies. Yeah, I would request that we do it depending on the group the way we have the data rather than trying to take Perfect. all of our data and turn it into FTEs. Does that seem reasonable to you? Yes, and I can work with Mr. Milner on those because he has a little bit better understanding of it as of this point. Yep. Is it just going to be one number per program, or would there be some level, some grouping breakout? So if there are, for example, in the custodial category, different categories of employee within that well, line item, can you break it out? Does the board really want to know how many custodian no. ones, I, no, twos, I think and it's important. Have? I think it's important that, personally, I think it's important that the, the, um, the staffing report is embedded in the budget document so that when when I'm looking for it's not important to know how many custodians we have at, at um, one two three at one at A B and C school. It is important that I don't have to look somewhere else for the staffing report and then some and then look back at the budget and it that it's that it's close together. The, that the, it's embedded in that the staffing report is embedded um, in the budget document somewhere, and the the staffing report as it exists, so mainly showing teachers, mm -hmm. is in the budget document. What I'm what I'm hearing is we would add on to that for all of the other groups that are are not in there. Yes. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, when you do have a budget for a department such as um, um, psycho med medical is that all people who would have a do the people who provide clerical support for that department are their salaries reflected there or are they reflected in overall clerical somewhere else do you understand what I'm asking for for a department uh, program program words are hard words are hard there's, there's so many of them <laughs> okay so it, so um, for some it does happen uh, for clerical if if it was a if it was a secretary in a school, it would be separate. If it was a secretary in a department uh, at the ECC, it would go with that group. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was an aide in a school, they wouldn't be attached to a particular program. I'm comfortable with what we just talked about. So for, and then before we do a deep dive further, because again, I don't know that I would be able to say that's the wrong amount of clerical support for student psychological services. All right, you two, this, this is your baby. How are you feeling? I feel like I would like to have, and I hope Ellen, you're with me on this, the three pages of information that's in the Waukesha report that was shared with staff. I mean, I can email it to you again. It's three pages of numbers. Yeah, I'm, I'm behind that. I'm, I'm behind the, uh, the support report. This is a one-page thing out of... Mm -hmm, which is kind of what we just asked for. Yeah. So that looks like we've got it. And then you also wanted one uh, giving more information on the calculation of the levy. I did want that, but if I have to choose, I want the three pages for the general fund, which is one page of revenues and two of expenditures. The three pages? Or is it the four pages? Three. No, three pages. Walk shot. And that, that's, that is this. Is this possible on our timeline? For Mr. Milzer, sorry. For what? When? Next You're year. talking next about this year or next year? Next, next year. year. Okay. Yeah, it's not for this year's budget. It's next year. No. No, for next year's budget, I'm 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 thinking all these changes are for next year's budget. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Right. So so putting these things together is definitely possible for next year. Okay. Thank you. Send you an email that will summarize these specific ones. Okay. Okay. Is everybody reasonably reasonably ready to move on? Yes. So are we clear as we're getting it? I think as a board we didn't 
vote on it yet. That this, this is, is in the voting item. item. So, yeah. Yeah. so we have consensus that that's what we want to see. That's, this. I the feel consent. like we do. Yeah. We do. Okay. And Alan, you're going to carry that through. Yeah. Sure, uh, please. All right, item 10, school board liaison reports. Mr. Uh, Ms. Craig, we didn't have consensus. Ms. Miller was waiting sort of for all of us to weigh in on that. Oh, okay. I believe we had consensus on the HR piece mm -hmm. and the cost for the groups going in. Uh, and we had a suggestion that for the Waukesha piece that it would come back for exactly what we were talking about and then the board would decide as a board if they wanted it or not. That was where I heard that left off with not that all sounds, in favor. That sounds fine to me. We have to talk about this again? Because we, no one can see the, the report that we emailed? Is that what we're saying? I think that we are sort of stuck on adding everything in this Waukesha report to the current report that we have, that we all agreed or there was seemed to be a consensus on the HR report being paired with this um, budget document that we have. Okay, well, let's bring I it definitely back. Feel, I definitely feel like there's consensus on that. I absolutely agree with that as well. Well, um, I don't think we have consensus on taking everything in the Waukesha document and then putting it into our current document. I think that's where Dr. Beer was saying, what specifically do you want it, from it? So you, this, yeah. Right, specifically yeah. all of it. Yeah. Okay, well now that we know you're asking specifically for all of that, I can review specifically those three pages and, um, but I'm not prepared to. Okay, we'll come back in yeah. next meeting. And when we all, we're all here. Thank you. Item 10, school board liaison reports, personnel and policy, policy 5380, McKinney Bento Homeless Assistance. Uh, this is normally Dr. Kahn's uh, uh, territory. Um, since he is not here, uh, Mrs. Cody, please. All right, I'm back up again here. Um, so there were a few revisions made to this policy, and the changes um, to the policy administrative rule were made to reflect updates to the definition of homeless children and unaccompanied adult, un, unaccompanied youth. Um, details were also added to provide more clarity about the appeals process. And then there was also a change made to the section about who serves as the district liaison for homeless children and youths. Um, it previously identifies the social worker, but it's actually our auxiliary services coordinator who currently serves as the district liaison. I move that we accept the amended policy as presented. Second. My motion has been, uh, any discussion? Yes. On page five under district liaisons for homeless children and youth, this is my being nitpicky, sorry. It states after crossing out what we oh, yeah. have crossing out there, the district administrator shall identify a designee to serve, to serve as. Oh, good yep. call. Yeah, that, that's got to get rid of that. So there's just some duplication of language on page five. I have a question. How many uh, kids do we, that fall under this, do we see in a year or over the last years? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't have to be exact, but there are obviously more than zero? Yeah, a handful. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of individuals who, um, find themselves in a situation where they're homeless. Mm -hmm. And there are very, very important laws that govern how they are treated by a school district. So we do adhere to them. And then their homelessness is resolved, I'm guessing, fairly quickly? Or? Um, sometimes not. Sometimes yeah. not. Mm -mm. Again, it depends case by case, you know, and uh, the reason why, you know, they're, <clears throat> Their family was impacted, so yeah. Thank you. So I want to amend my motion to reflect the striking of the repeated language on page five, as identified by Mr. Alexandrovich. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B, personnel and policy, policy 5340, child abuse and neglect. Uh, Mrs. Cody, please. 
Okay, so changes to this policy were made to better align our language in the format with current language and format recommendations of other professional organizations and the statute language. The definition of maltreatment that was previously included in the policy is really part of the required training, so there was no need to include that detail, uh, that level of detail in the policy, so that was removed. And then changes to administrative rules reflect updates to the reporting procedures to better align with the language and procedures outlined in the required DPI training, providing more clarity around the individual responsibilities of the mandated reporter and the importance of confidentiality. Mrs. Wachowski, please. So the, um, under the guidelines item one, the district employee shall immediately call the welfare office. So they don't even go to the school psychology. They're not even required to. They, they just no. make that call. Mandatory that's reporters. Legally, that's how it goes. Yeah, teachers are mandatory. I understand they're mandatory re reporting, but um, they don't involve, uh, do we become aware of them? Well, yes. So, I mean, the way that this is written, again, we're, we're all mandatory reporters. So um, the way that it was previous, previously written, it said collaborate with, and it listed people from student services. And it there was a little bit of gray area in terms of the personal responsibility of the mandated reporter. So, I mean, I would, I'm, would venture a guess that someone, if they had a concern, they would go to report it. And in here, it does say that you may go to the school psychologist or someone just to, you know, share uh, the concerns and maybe just double check on procedures or things like that. But ultimately, you are required to make that report. So um, that's why it's written the way it is to be very clear around that. So the report has to be made in their name. Is that the? Correct. Yes. Okay. You can't. Yes. The, the most primary thing is you don't want to ever delay making a report mm -hmm. out of concern that I need to notify my superior, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would make the motion to accept policy 5340 as presented. Second. <coughs> All right. The motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Yes. Sure. Please. Um, we struck out what uh, the physical abuse that under the state law, the different forms as defined as follows, and you said because that's part of the training. Mm -hmm. But this is a board policy, and as a board member, I was reading through this whole thing, and if I didn't see that area that was crossed out, I would have no idea what you're talking about, physical abuse. At what level does it become abuse? If a, if a parent hits the, their mm -hmm. child's bottom, abuse? It doesn't leave, leave a bruise or mm -hmm. all these things that are kind of laid out here, although it says a physical injury inflicted on a child by other than accidental means Physical injury includes, but is not limited to, mm -hmm. and then it talks about lacerations mm -hmm. and fractures. And, but we, we need that. Okay. If it's a board policy, I think the board needs to have that in there. It's difficult to do that within policy language because um, you don't want to put something here and assume that that's the only thing that it but is. It says, it could but not go, limited to. Correct. So I think that you know, it's very clear that this is governed by statute and you could refer to the statute to get the, the legal definition because if, if you don't exactly get it right in your policy, you could have some problems with any language or definitions you use in your policy that don't pair, you know, exactly with the law. So we did that with a, a more recent policy as well. We removed definitions from the policy and rather refer to what the statute says. It's just a better place to be with your policy in terms of not leaving something out that is really important <laughs> to have as part of the definition of these so things. Which one of the statutes refers to? It's in the paragraph above. The definition. That might be is a it? good thing to add is you have your links about the different statutes referenced. Mm -hmm. You could say Wisconsin statute defining abuse, Wisconsin statute on whatever. I don't know if that would help direct people to the correct thing below. Mm -hmm. Their legal references, legal references below. have links. Yeah, there's four of them. Mm -hmm. And it's also as much as I'd love to read all four of those. Yeah, and and all of our personnel have to go through this training. Yeah, that's it. All of them. 
but this is a board. Right. But we don't really, policy. we can't decide what's, what yeah. state statute, you know, if we don't like the words that state statute has, but we can't change a state statute. I'm not asking you to change it. I'm asking you to be able to understand what physical abuse is. So everyone who's going to be held to this policy is going to go through training to right. understand that. So really then the only people left who don't understand it is me on the board. Correct. Who's approving this? Okay. But you're so why didn't you read reference. the statute? You're proving it with the reference. reference. So read the statute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the statutes could change. That's why. That's. That's why. Right. You don't have to bring you, the policy back when right. the the definition changes within the yeah. statute. And I just I hear your on, point. I just clicked on that thing. Language Alan and the statute is is quite extensive and should answer any questions about what abuse might be. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I feel comfortable that we're covered. Well, if you're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I made my point. In a second. <laughs> all right, any other discussion? All right, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, C, board liaison reports. In the interest of time, I've met with uh, the principal of Ben Franklin twice this year as the liaison. She's presented to me their goals for their school improvement plan. All three have to do with academic improvement. They're very clearly laid out, and she identified her plan for meeting them. So I'd be happy to go into detail on that if anyone's interested. I've also met with our interim director of instruction and learning and talked about the areas of curriculum that are being uh, looked at this year. Uh, specifically the idea of having our math coaches dedicated for each grade level, which seems to be going well thus far, and then also the review of literacy curriculum at middle and high school levels over this year, which we will be hearing about in November. Thank I'm happy you. to talk to any of you about it if you're interested. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted just to first. update from the Franklin Education Foundation. I serve as liaison um, for that, and you should mark your calendars for December 3rd. We'll be having um, an online trivia night as we did back during <laughs> the pandemic. I forget when exactly it was. Dr. Beer, do you remember? It was that? April of last year. April of last year. Um, so there will be, you know, an online trivia night for the community as well as an auction to um, as a fundraiser for the foundation. So this is my husband's <laughs> community giving back activity is writing trivia. So anyway, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I almost the won. last one. <laughs> I almost won. You almost won. Well, I mean, not, not I don't. So that was the foundation. That's my liaison report for that. I did also um, share with you the SWSA uh, slide deck. I I was able to actually listen into the last part of it oh, okay. on the plane. I thought, mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you sharing those yep. because I find them completely fascinating and there's just a really a lot of really good information so thank you for always sending those around I, it's good it gives you a broad perspective yep. so that's all and i went i met with mrs cody um and uh we talked largely about the at-risk report and uh and um, what we were talking about tonight so i won't go into i won't <laughs> go into that further anyone else school and community engagement reports Anyone? I can start. Um, Please. Just different things that we've been involved in. There was a choir concert um, on the 30th, which is great to see children actually back in person and singing. They did, it was called an informant. It was a little bit more informal because they've only had three weeks of classes at that point, but it was very exciting. Very fun to be back, live performances. Um, we were all part of the home, well, most of us were part of the homecoming parade last week, and that was great to be out in the community with the parade, um, football games swim and dive um, meets in the last couple of weeks, but I wanted to really share our big news with our tennis team as well as our football team's been doing, that's great, I love it, but our tennis team has made it to state, mm -hmm. both as a team and as individual for the first time, I believe, ever. So I attended sectionals last week, it was very exciting, it's my first time ever attending a tennis match, you guys yeah. should really do it, it's very exciting, <laughs> really intense. Um, but anyway, it was, it was great, and so they leave tomorrow for their um, individual state tournament, and then next weekend they'll have their team state tournament, so go Franklin Tennis. And that Sorry. was hosted at the Greendale Village Club. Yep, sectionals was um, hosted at the Greendale Village Club. That's our home oh. turf, I guess, because we don't have our own tennis courts, so oh. <laughs> it, w it was our home, home meet, kind of. 
All right, anyone else? Okay. Uh, item 11, closed session. Looking for a motion to enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin state statute 19.851F for purposes of meeting with a complainant under policy 5011, non-discrimination of students on the basis of disability in an attempt to resolve the complainant's grievance as part of step three under board policy 5011's grievance procedure and pursuant to Wisconsin state statute 19.851D to review district threat of violence drill action, uh, drill. And that's an action item. So moved. Second. Right. Yeah. All right, uh, I think we need a roll call. We do. Mrs. Witkowski? Aye. Mr. Alexandrovich? Aye. Mrs. Sapersky? Aye. Dr. Beer? Aye. I vote aye. Mr. Sprague? Aye. We are in closed session at 825. I'm looking for a motion to authorize the school board president to respond on behalf of the board to the complaint reviewed and discussed in closed session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. School board member comments. a better way to um, accommodate discussion if somebody is opposed to something. I didn't appreciate being cut off and called out and whatever that scene was about. Linda, you do dig in and drag things out. Well, if we could find a better way to end that then. Well, when what, I made... What's when a better I, way to end it? When I, when I made the point on the issue that I had with not knowing... Um, what what is uh, abusive to a child and it was explained I said okay I made my point and I, and I stopped because there wasn't any great support for what I was saying and it didn't look like we we're gonna change anybody's mind so at some point you stop beating that dead horse we weren't actually uh, expecting to vote on this item so I wanted to share as much information as I could I didn't see, hear new information coming up. Maybe we can say, do you have new information as opposed to what Debbie said? Can we be I, more? Uh, I can go with that. And I don't think it's, when we had this report come at us and we, we knew this was a topic that came up, but it wasn't clear um, who was speaking when and we spoke over each other. It wasn't a real good back and forth either. So, <coughs> so we do have a, a more casual um, approach to our conversation. We don't ask to be addressed by the chair. We can certainly go in that direction, but um, I think for the most part, our conversations flow fairly well, as long as we are a bit more cognizant of um, each other's feelings. That sounded very, I know, silly and kindergarten teacherish. I've been trying to more often recognize people mm -hmm. that I see want to speak. Um, I've noticed but I agree that. with I agree with uh, Mr. Alexandrovich that at some point making the same point over and over again doesn't make it any more relevant. Well, then why don't we say that as opposed to I heard you say this, this and this and we've heard you then move on. How about okay, we'll okay. try that next time. And then if you receive that information you have to remember what it is that it's saying. You know what I mean? If somebody yes, says I that. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Okay. So it's reasonable. We can do better. All right. Um, does anybody else have any comments? Uh, I, I have a comment. Um, I, I I think that um, with regard to uh, the letter sent out by the NSBA, um, if I thought that there was people that were um, if I thought that there was people that were coming into these meetings that were terrorists, um, I would have I would have security here. I, I do not think they are. Um, I would agree with that as well. So, um, I, I I think we've acted in that way. I think we've acted in that way, um, and I hope we continue to act in that way. Um, I, I we're a school board, a local school board that um, I, I hope we listen to. 
all people, even if um, even if we decide things differently than they'd like us to. Um, okay, I was going to, you, were you done? Yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, I also thought that it was a very valid point that all we could see is Michelle's children, example of Michelle's children writing, spelling, uh, and what she says about math, but I think that that is a problem, and I don't think we're addressing it well. And as far as uh, the math goes, the, the one mother who came here and made a comment that when they were doing it virtually, and she sat through the lesson for math, and sat through the example, and until if she didn't have the example right there, she couldn't do it, and it, she just struggled with it. And she sat there day after day. I don't know what we're teaching, but it, it's not math. Is that a future agenda item? I, I think we can. Yeah, this is this is just comments. I don't think that math, the math curriculum, is on our list for a review this no. year, but literacy certainly is. So. Yeah. Both concerns. All right. Does anybody else have any other comments? Thank you, everyone. Uh, future agenda items, Southwood Glen Elementary School presentation, annual health report, employee handbook update, enrollment and staffing report, 21-22 uh, budget approval, district administrator goals, early college credit and start college now request approvals, inroads program, education for employment plan, new course approvals and the 22-23 school calendar are all coming up in uh, the next couple of meetings. Um, so we are going to remain busy. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The meeting is adjourned at 924.